Interlude. Going somewhere? Lay's ribs were a single massive ache. Every ounce of energy was gone. Even opening her eyes seemed not worth the effort. She was stretched out on a cold stone slab, but she was so exhausted that the comfort seemed minimal. But there was something, something important. The voice. She knew that voice. She forced her eyes open. Her father was standing next to her, leaning over her and glancing at a sheet of parchment, as if he were comparing what he saw to notes on a schematic. Back now? Good. He made a note on the parchment. His expression and his tone were completely neutral, so much like the last time she'd seen him. But something was different. His hair. The color was richer and deeper than she'd ever seen it. The copper catching the light to burn with an inner fire. And his skin. It was free of lines. She tried to speak. But she didn't even have the energy to open her mouth. Her father seemed to notice her discomfort. Don't struggle. There's still work to be done. A young woman stepped into her field of view. How is she? She'll be fine, Alicia. I don't think any permanent damage was done. Alisa? Her mother? But this woman looked younger than Lay herself. And the others? The pair turned away from her. She could see that there were a few other slabs in the chamber. A warforged soldier, each distinctly different from the others, was stretched out on top of each slab. Her parents were studying the figure on the next slab over, less than three feet away. No matter how hard she struggled, Lei couldn't move. But from where she was, she could see it. It was Pierce. The work continues apace, her father said. It was a traumatic experience for both of them, but the safeguards serve their purpose. If anything, it may have helped to prepare this one for the task that lies ahead. Good, the woman said. She turned around and studied Lei, running her hand along her daughter's cheek. Don't worry, she said gently. You're doing fine. You're doing everything you're supposed to do. I'm afraid a few adjustments will be needed to be made, her father said. He had produced a few exotic tools, a long narrow blade studded with dragon shards, and a pair of delicate silver tongs. I imagine it will be painful for her. The woman stroked Lay's cheek again, staring into her eyes. Then she rose and turned her back on her daughter. Do what you must, she said, her voice cool. I need to check on the others. Alesa walked out of Lay's field of view. Her father moved in, raising the tongs and the razor-sharp blade. He brought the point up until it was level with her right eye, and then he pushed. Chapter 43 Lay sat up. Dane had been half dozing, but the sudden motion jarred him to consciousness. Lay? Lay? Are you alright? He reached out and took her hand. Lay looked from side to side. Dane was sitting next to her, and Pierce was to her left. The sight of Pierce brought an involuntary whimper from her throat. His impassive metal face brought back the image of her dream and the blinding pain in her eye. Can you speak, my lady? Pierce said, his voice deep and calm. I can. Her ribs still ached with a dull, throbbing pain, but her energy was returning. She raised an arm, touching her forehead and her cheeks. Where are we? 
It looked like a room in a small and comfortable inn, a considerable step up from the manticore. There was a pillow beneath her head, and while the pallet beneath her was hardly remarkable, it was the softest thing she'd slept on in at least three years. It's a Jurasco house, Dane said. The Jurasco halflings were masters of the healing arts, and every large city had at least one Jurasco enclave. We couldn't rouse you, and we still had some money left over from Alina's last advance. While her ribs still ached, after she'd had a moment to collect her senses, Lay realized that her legs felt fine. She pulled back the blankets. There wasn't even a mark where Dane had stabbed her. I... I wanted that dealt with quickly, Dane said, somewhat sheepishly. I didn't want you to have to limp around town because of me. The thought of Jurasco's healing touch brought back other memories. Jode? He's gone, Lay. It wasn't a dream. He's not coming back. Lay nodded. Her head was quickly clearing, but she felt empty inside. What had been a dream? She looked over at Pierce and started to reach out to touch him, but at the last moment she drew her hand back. Are you all all right? I have fully recovered, Pierce said. I am grateful for your actions. Whatever the risk, I would not wish to be responsible for the death of a friend. I thought I was going to kill you, she thought. But she did not say it aloud. I do feel different, however, Pierce continued. I cannot explain it exactly. My senses seem sharper, my movements more precise. May I ask what you did when you stopped me? I don't really know, Pierce. I just reached within you, hoping to find some way to slow you down. I'm still not sure what that mind flayer was doing before I escaped. I was exposed to a number of different alchemical substances, and the memories are somewhat unclear. Pierce nodded. It appears we have worked out for the best, and all in all, it was an interesting experience. What about Chirask? I inflicted significant injuries on the creature in our initial encounter. Pierce said. At least six of my arrows struck home in the second encounter. I believe that it was dead by the time it fell. If not, I'm guessing the fall finished the job, or whatever that liquid was that it fell into, Dane said. We took a few moments to cut the chains supporting those incubation chambers. Chirask never resurfaced and I didn't feel its presence in my mind. I think we've finished it off. What else? Dane frowned. Well, we smashed the tanks and destroyed everything we could. No one will be making new monsters down there anytime soon. But I'm still worried about what Tural said. If he really did come to Sharn with a hundred followers, not to mention those created by Chirask over the last two months. That means that there are dozens out there that we haven't seen. I've mentioned it to Greyco, but most of the graphs seem to be easily concealable, and we don't even know that all of Taral's followers settled in high walls. I, I don't know. I imagine they'll be keeping a low profile. But... I don't like thinking about what horrors might still be hidden in high walls. A stout, middle-aged halfling entered the room, 
the griffin badge of Jurasco on the breast of his brown robe. He was carrying a small tray bearing a bowl of clear broth and a mug of pungent million tall. Ah, you're awake. Good. He set the tray down by the bed and climbed up on a footstool to examine her. The mark of healing could be seen poking up from the collar of his robes, and once again, Lay's thoughts drifted back to Jode. The healer touched a finger to her forehead, and she felt a slight tingle. You're doing just fine, the little man said. He pressed the towel into her hand. Drink now. He looked back to Dane. I still can't tell you exactly what happened, but she's making an excellent recovery. With a few more days of rest, she'll be as healthy as she's ever been. Thank you, Sold. The pleasure is mine. I would imagine it's safe for her to move about at this point. If you would like to remain here for a few more days, you can settle things with Astrin out front. The halfling bowed, then trotted out the door. I'm fine, Dane, Lay said. So don't tell me that I'm confined to bed. Drink your tall, Dane said. Personally, I think the rest would do you good. But if you don't want to stay here, I'm not about to make it an order. It's up to you. He stood up. But now that you're conscious, I need to make our final delivery to Alina before she comes to the conclusion that we failed. Lay drained the cup of bitter towel and pushed herself out of bed. Her legs were a little stiff, and she felt momentarily lightheaded, but it quickly passed. I'm coming with you. What? Dane said. Why do you want to do that? I'd avoid Alina if I had the choice. I can't just stay here. Especially here. Not after what happened to Jode. Your healer said I was healthy. He also said you needed a few more days of rest. She gave him a look. You'd lie here, drinking broth, if you were in my boots? She took a few steps forward, gingerly at first. Where are my goods? Dane produced her pack from under his chair, and she began to sort through it. She pulled out her leather jerkin. She hadn't noticed in the battle, but the alchemical bath had eaten through the upper back. She sighed. She could repair it, but it would take time. She pulled out the darkwood staff and frowned. Did you do this? she asked Dane. When she'd last seen it, the staff had been marred by a half dozen deep gouges. In places, Dane's blade had almost split the shaft in two, but those marks were gone. It was in perfect condition, even to the polished finish. Dane shook his head. I haven't touched it. Other than putting it in your bag, he scowled. That squid may have used it to get inside my head. I'll tell you now. I don't like that staff, Lay. There's too much we don't know. What it can do. Why the Sphinx wanted you to have it. Maybe you should get rid of it. Lay set her weight against the staff. It might have been her imagination, but she suddenly felt better. A little stronger. A little more alert. Don't be stupid, she said. Without the staff, we wouldn't have survived long enough for Pierce to finish Chirask. Once we have a little more time, I'll sit down with it. I'm sure that I can unlock its secrets. Fine, Dane shrugged. Come if you want. But this, let's get this done quickly. After Dean settled accounts with the Jurascos, they made their way to the lift in silence. As they rose into the sky, Dane turned to Lay. What about what happened down there, Lay? You weren't in control of yourself. Neither was Pierce. I know. But it felt so real, as if they were my thoughts. I can't help but wonder if there was some part of me that could have resisted, that should have known. 
Lei put her hand on his arm. Dane, it's not your fault. If not for the staff, I would have been just as vulnerable. It wasn't you. He closed his eyes for a moment, then looked back at her. It wasn't just the staff, Lei. He sighed. You've known me for a few years, but there's a lot you don't know. What I did before I joined the Siren Guard. How it is I know Alina. I've always kept a certain distance between us. And I hope, when I explain that you'll understand why. She watched him silently. But now, now we need to determine what happens next. If Alina pays us, is this in doubt? Pierce asked. Probably not, but with Alina, I don't think you can be certain of anything. The question is, what do we do with the gold? Where do we go from here? The question hung in the air. Lei had been banned from her house. Her betrothed was dead. Pierce had been built for battle, to fight in a war that had ended, and everything Dane had fought for had come to an end on the day of mourning. Dane turned to face his two comrades. If Alina pays us, we could go anywhere. But where do you want to go, Lei? If you wanted to get away from here, I understand. Lei shook her head. No. If this Merricks has issues with me, that's his problem. I rather like the idea of living the good life under his nose. Show him I'm not going to crawl under a rock and die just because he's cut me off. Dane nodded. Pierce, how about you? There is little that I need in this world, Captain. I have no interest in this gold, but I wish to remain with the two of you. For that reason, I hope that you will stay together. Which brings me back to my past. Before I joined the guard, I... All the lifts in Sean, and he comes to mine. By now, Sergeant Lorak's gravelly voice was a familiar sound. Dane turned. The dwarf watchman was standing by the gate of the lift with a pair of halberdiers. I see your little fall. Did it knock any senses into you? Lorak said. Dane walked over to the dwarf. The halberdiers lowered their weapons, but Lorak stopped them with a gesture. How long is this going to go on, Lorak? Why, Morn? Do you have somewhere to go? My name is Dane, Sergeant. He dropped to one knee, to look the dwarf directly in the eye. And you know what? I don't have anywhere to go. My homeland was destroyed. Your king invited my people to come here, and here I am. Lorax stared at him, saying nothing. We're not at war anymore, Sergeant. I'm not going anywhere. As a matter of fact, I imagine I'll be taking this lift on a regular basis. If you'd like, we can take turns throwing each other off. I believe it's your turn, but I'm guessing... Those feather tokens, they add up on a watchman's salary. I know they will for a refugee. Lorax stayed silent, but there was a twitch at the corner of his mouth. I didn't mean to throw you off the lift that first time we met, Dane continued. You charged me. And you know what? You were right. That girl did rob me. I hope you were just trying to scare her. I don't like the idea of guards murdering anyone, criminal or not. But I owe you an apology, Sergeant. So can we start this thing over? One soldier to another? The dwarf stared at him for a long while. Finally, he nodded. All right, more... Uh, Dane. He didn't smile. We've both been over that edge once, no? 
You mind your business, and I'll leave you be. But I don't want to see any trouble on my watch. Interfere with my work again, and I'll have your head grazing be damned. Fair enough. Dane stood and walked back over to his friends. A moment later, the lift arrived at Denias. Chapter 44 Alina was waiting for them in the Room of Mirrors. Today, she was dressed in a gown of black and gold, with amethyst-tipped rods tucked through her golden hair. Dane idly wondered if these were pure decoration, or if they might be magic wands. It would be just like Alina to wear a mystic arsenal as a form of decoration. I trust you come to me with results, Dane, she said. There was a silver-scaled serpent wrapped around her left wrist, and she idly scratched its chin. She wore a platinum ring on each finger, each one set with a different gemstone or dragon shard. Oh, is it yet another plea for gold? Dane reached into his belt pouch and produced a small cloth bag. He set it down on the table and slid it toward her. I believe this is what you sent us to find. Alina held her wrist up to her hair, and the tiny viper slithered off her arm to coil around one of her long hair rods. She picked up the bag and carefully spread its contents out across the table. There were two large chunks of dark crystal lined with deep blue veins, a host of smaller shards, and two glass vials corked and sealed with lead. The vials were filled with a shadowy fluid, and the lid of each vial was marked with a complex symbol, similar to a dragon mark, but matching none of the twelve known marks. Alina picked up one of the vials and examined it carefully. The people who stole your goods and killed Raciel had developed a process to remove dragon marks. That's supposed to be the essence of the dragon mark. At least, an aberrant dragon mark. I have no idea what you're supposed to do with it, since the people who'd stolen it hadn't done anything with it. It may well be dangerous. Fascinating, she said Alina. She glanced over at Dane. And the tools they used in this extraction procedure? It was a rough fight, Alina. We were almost all killed. And I'm afraid the workshop was destroyed in the battle. You said to recover whatever was left of your shards. You didn't say anything about limiting property damage in the process. Alina shrugged. I'm sure there was nothing that could be done. A tragic loss, however. She studied the vial more closely. I suppose... That this battle occurred after you visit to Council Terrell's tent in High Walls? It's good to know you're keeping an eye on us. Alina smiled. I always like to watch my investments. You know that. If you've been keeping close... If you've been keeping such a close watch on us, I suppose you already know about Jode. Alina set the vial down and placed a hand over her heart. Yes. Dane, I am truly sorry. He will not be soon forgotten, and I can only give thanks that the rest of you survived the experience. She glanced down at the two dark vials. What intrigues me is the fact that these villains preserved these aberrant dragon marks, but let Jode's mark slip through their fingers. She glanced up at Dane, her violet eyes cold in her otherwise perfect mask of sympathy. Surely a fool could see how valuable the essence of such a mark might be? 
Vain said nothing, and Lay spoke on his behalf. There could be any number of explanations, she said. Perhaps the process hadn't been perfected, and they failed to capture the mark. Perhaps they already put it to use. Though I still don't know how you'd apply it. Alina studied Lay, and for a moment she said nothing. Lay found the experience disturbing. Alina was the size of a human child, but it was hard to reconcile that with her elegance and intelligence. From the way Dane acted around her, it was clear that Alina was dangerous, but Lay still hadn't learned what made her such a threat. Finally, Alina spoke. True, that is ever the way with magical experimentation, and I suppose that it's for the best. If someone did find a reliable way to remove and transfer the powers of a dragon mark, what would happen to our civilization? Certainly, if I could buy a dragon mark, I would, and I'm certain I'm not alone. As you've already seen, there are those who would be more than willing to kill to obtain the power. She smiled at Lei. How lucky for you, my dear, that the workshop was destroyed. Dane shivered. He knew that Alina's minions would be searching through the wreckage beneath high walls before the day was done. He hoped he and Pierce had done enough damage to render the workshop useless, though somehow remembering the inhuman thoughts that had flowed through his mind, Dane thought the technique might require the touch of the Mind Flayer. In any case, you have completed your task, and at a terrible cost. How would you like to receive your payment? In coin, jewels, a letter of credit? Actually, Alina, I have a favor to ask. Alina's eyes glittered in the light of the amethyst fire. A favor? Well, what can I do for you, Dane? I imagine that when it comes to matters of business, you have a few connections in the city. Indeed. Well, I was wondering if you'd take a portion of our payment and help us uh, purchase property in Sharn. Alina arched a perfect eyebrow. A piece of the tower. A costly proposition. I'm interested in a place in high walls. Alina's face was as expressionless as ever. But Dane could feel her sneer. Well, yes, that I could arrange. Do you want a hole in the wall or something vaguely bearable? Now Dane could feel lay stare. Bearable. As good as we can get. No lice. A tall odor in high walls, Alina said. But one I can accomplish, she considered for a moment, then reached through one of the mirrored walls. When her hand emerged, she was holding a small casket. She handed it to Lei. A respectable home will be expensive, even in high walls. But here, my lady Lei, a hundred platinum dragons for you and your friends. Hopefully, you can find some little luxury amidst the squalor your captain has chosen for you. Lei took the casket but said nothing. As for you, Dane, I'm sure that you can imagine my surprise when I found an heirloom of sword in the hands of a pawnbroker. I was even more surprised by the condition it was in. The pommel had been badly damaged. I had it restored to its original condition, and I thought that you might want it back. She reached into the mirror again and pulled out a long sword. Dane's sword but it was almost unrecognizable. The blade had been sharpened and polished to a mirror finished, but what drew the eye was the hilt. 
when he had served in the guard, the pommel of Dane's sword had been worn down, devoid of any trail. Now the hilt was as polished as the blade, and the pommel was glittering black and silver, engraved with the watchful eye of House Denise. I'm sure that your grandfather would be proud to see it back in your hands, said Alina, smiling slightly. Dane took the sword without a word. Lay and Pierce looked at him, but it was clear from his expression that this was not the time to ask questions. It will take a few days to locate an appropriate property, Alina said. I'll arrange for rooms at the Silver Tree for the interim. It's just down Prosper Street. We still have our room at the Manticore, Dane said. Dane, Alina said reprovingly. Won't you allow your companions a chance to see the best that Sean has to offer before you settle down in the depths? Enjoy a few days of luxury at least. Consider it a gift. I told you before, Alina. Dane paused and turned away. He looked at Lay. You know what? Fine. We'll be leaving, then. I'll be in touch when I've located your new home. And I was very pleased with the way you handled yourselves. All of you. I'm sure I'll have more work for you soon. Until then, she gestured, and the mirror door drifted open. You know the way out. I'm sure you'll have more work for you soon. Dane fumed as they made their way through the relentless cheer of the streets of Denias, whether you like it or not. Lay caught him by the arm and pulled him to a halt. High walls? He looked away. You said you were willing to stay in the city for a time. I thought we'd be able to get the most of our gold in high walls. I told you before, Dane, Seer was your home, not mine. I only lived there. You were born in Seer, Lay. You fought at our side. Your parents died there. For a moment, there was a flash of real anger, and he thought he might have pushed her too far. And you, she said. How do you explain this? She slapped the pommel of his sword. Is there something we should know, Dane, with no name? Do we... Need to have this conversation in the street? I want answers. Now. Fine, Dane said. I was born into House Denise. My father is General Doran de Denise of the Blade Mark. This, this is my father's blade. And yes, I removed the sigil when I joined the Siren Guard. Do you have... The Mark of Sentinel? No. I failed the test of Siberus, much to the disgust of my father. They looked away, embarrassed. But that was only one of many disappointments, and far from the worst. You see, I cared. I wanted to believe in what I was fighting for, to believe that I was actually serving a noble cause. But when your family business is built on selling your sword for gold, caring is a crime. You fight for anyone with the gold, and you do whatever you're ordered to do. His tone had become more intense with each sentence. They still couldn't meet his gaze. For a time... Uh... I played the part of the good son. I served a wealthy client of the house, and I did whatever was asked of me. I saw things, and did things, that will haunt my dreams until the day I die. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I renounced my birthright and turned to something I did believe in, the nation of Seer. The nation that had sheltered me since I was a child, whose values I admire to this day. Perhaps I wasn't born a citizen of Seer, 
but in my few years of service, I learned more about morality and friendship than I ever did as a child of Denise. Dane. He took a deep breath. And the irony... Look what it got me. I threw away my inheritance for a land now dead. It seems my father was right after all. Live for the moment. Take your satisfaction from the work, not the master. Dane, enough! He just looked at her. Fine. I didn't know. Obviously, I have a lot to learn. And obviously, you've been keeping a lot of secrets from us. Now it was Dane who looked away. But what does this have to do with now? With a life in high walls? Greyka was right. Seer is gone, and we need to move on. And I admit it. You deserve better than you've received these last few years. I know that. But High Walls still feels as close to home as we'll find here. I know it's not what you're used to, but... Lay. A hundred dragons won't buy a mansion in the clouds. Lay sighed, but acknowledged the point. I don't know what happens next. I was fighting for a cause. And that cause is gone. I'm a soldier. I'm not some sort of refugee caregiver. I'm not going to start wandering around like Greykel, helping people find work. But I, I don't know, Dane said. Tyrell was a strong figure in the community. I'm sure there's going to be chaos with him gone. Greykel can handle it, possibly. But what about Tyrell's other followers? I'm not going to become a caretaker, and I'm not asking you to help. But I am a soldier, and if I can help to protect these people, I will. I was created to protect the people of Seer, Pierce rumbled. I will join you. This wouldn't be a constant commitment, Lay, Dane said. But we'd be there if Greykel and her militia needed help. In the meantime, we look for other work. Look for something to believe in, for a cause worth fighting for. Lay pondered for a moment. Why do I hear Jod when you're speaking? Dane thought about Jod, about the halfling who let a young goblin steal their gold. Because you know he'd say the same thing. Fine, Lay said. But I'm sick of sleeping on moldy hard pallets. We've got a hundred dragons to spend. I expect a good bed. As you wish. And I never want to see a bowl of gruel again. No complaints here. Well then, let's get back to the manticore. If we give her some gold, do you suppose Dassy can get us some real meat for dinner? After gruel, lizard is next on my list of forbidden foods. They linked arms with Pierce and Dane, and they walked to the lift that would take them home. Later that night, Dane excused himself and returned to the dusty room, rummaging through his pack he found the letter-wrapped bundle he'd hidden that morning and carefully unwrapped it. Inside, there was a small bottle made from thick crystal and sealed with lead. The fluid inside was a luminous blue, and the mark pressed into the seal was as familiar to him as a friend's face, the mark of healing, the mark of Jod. For a few moments, he sat alone in the dark, holding the bottle and staring into the glow. Finally, he wrapped the bottle up and placed it back in his pack. Good night, old friend, he whispered. Epilogue the room was full of shadows. Sunlight streamed through the solitary octagonal window, 
but this light had no power over the darkness. The shadows pooled in the corners of the room, and inky tendrils drifted across the room, obscuring the intricate sigils carved into the floor. A woman stood by the window, and the shadows clung to her feet like petulant hounds. Though the room was quite warm, the woman kept her long cloak wrapped closely around her body, and her face was hidden by a deep hood. Silently, she stood by the window and stared at the world below at the district of high walls almost three thousand feet beneath her. The wind was a constant presence, whistling and howling through the open window, but no matter how powerful these gusts became, they had no effect on the misty shadows that clung to the corners of the chamber or the deep hood that hid the lady's face. Report, she said. Her voice was a velvet purr, smooth and quiet, yet resonating throughout the chamber. The man hesitated, surprised. He had just entered the room and the lady's back was turned. He had a gift for moving quietly, and with the sound of the wind whistling through the chamber, it seemed impossible for her to have heard his approach. She turned around, her eyes gleaming in the depths of her hood. Captain, she said with a smile. Captain Grayson inclined his head respectfully. The workshop has been destroyed, and the Mind Flayer is dead. The damage was extensive, and we couldn't find anything of value. I doubt Chirask is dead, Grayson, she said. She lowered a hand toward the floor, and a tendril of mist reached up to embrace it. It is difficult to kill a child of Zoriat, and Dane lacks the knowledge such a task would require. But its power is broken for the moment. With its tools destroyed and its chief agent slain, I imagine that it will be some time before Chirask shows itself again. You... you aren't concerned. Grayson was visibly relieved. Not at all. Chirask served its purpose, as have my friends in the house of Canis. The only issue is flame wind, and whether they will make sense of her riddles before it is too late. Why haven't you eliminated the Sphinx if she poses a threat? Green eyes gleamed in the shadows, and for a moment Grayson thought he had overstepped his boundaries. But the lady answered, until I know what power Flame Wind serves, direct action is unwise, but I am not concerned. Everything goes according to my plans. Lei has been driven from her house. Jode is dead. Pierce is beginning to awaken to his true potential. And Dane, the dark mist swirled around her feet as she smiled. The game has been in motion for longer than you can imagine, Grayson. Now the end game begins. Keep an eye on Dane and his companions. Soon it will be time to put them into play. She dismissed him with a gesture, and Grayson left the room, running from the shadows and searching for the light. <laughs>